was one of the most feared combat aircraft of World War II. Yet throughout its dramatic history, it was plagued by an early reputation as being far too dangerous to fly. The B-26 Martin Marauder. I was just petrified when I realized here I was on an airbase full of those creatures. And I was going to have to be a pilot in one of them. Now, for the first time, the true story of its journey from death trap to fearsome adversary can be told. We knocked it down to rubble. We went twice a day. So we finally knocked it down and killed every German big enough to die. Using unique archive film and detailed color reenactments, Battle Stations enters the controversial and unpredictable world of the Martin B-26 Marauder. After the end of the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles, America was determined to stay out of international disputes. It adopted a policy of go it alone and retreated into a long period of isolation. For almost 20 years, the U.S. armed forces fell way behind those of modernizing Europe. In Europe, air superiority was recognized as the key to successful modern warfare. It was a time of major technical developments, with new theories and tactics for the new generation of fighter bombers. But by 1933, with Hitler's appointment as Chancellor, Germany had embarked on a rearmament program of epic proportions. The Nazi machine began to replace all its old warplanes and produce a new generation of bombers. Yet across the Atlantic, American aviation remained very much the world of the small town barnstorms. Latest American aeronautical innovation was geared towards luxurious commercial use with new stylish all-metal aircraft like the Boeing 247 and the DC-3. America's air power was simply not up to modern air combat standards. America pays too little attention to the rise of Nazism in Europe and too late does it identify the danger of Japanese expansionism. Now, one of the consequences of all this isolationism is that America had fallen behind in several key military areas, and aircraft was one of these. And on the eve of war, the Americans knew that they had to catch up, and fast. So in March 1939, a competition was urgently held for a new high-speed and heavily armed aircraft. The history on it is that the brass and the Air Force wanted a medium bomber with speed that could uh, more or less defend itself without fighter escort and was fast enough to evade fighters. Most importantly of all, the new bomber had to be able to go into production immediately. After just four months, the results of the competition were announced. The winner was a revolutionary twin-engine medium bomber designed by the Glenn L. Martin Company. The new aircraft had been designed by a young team led by a 26-year-old aeronautical engineer, Peyton M. McGrawder. McGrawder's radical new design was a sleek, heavily armed aircraft incorporating the latest aeronautical technology with short wings for high-speed performance. The aircraft had a top speed of 300 miles per hour. With developments in Europe causing increasing alarm, the US Army Air Corps was now under pressure to rearm and needed immediate delivery. Taking an unprecedented step, Martin's design was ordered to go straight from the drawing board into production. There would be no prototype for testing. This unique, off-the-shelf purchase was to sow seeds of disaster in the years to come. 
Just weeks after the contract was awarded, the expected war in Europe erupted. In a rush, the Army Air Corps ordered additional modifications of extra armor plating, torpedo racks, and a top gun turret, all of which substantially increased the weight of the aircraft. But there was no time for any evaluation or testing. The very first of this new generation of warplanes were delivered straight to the U.S. Army Air Corps. My first impression, going out to the flight line and joining with the first pilot, the instructor pilot, was that I was getting into something that would be the most modern that I had envisioned of anything flying up to that point. And so I knew that I was in something different when I first climbed into that cockpit area. My first impression that compared with what we'd been flying, it was a large aircraft. And I had had no experience in an airplane that size. Also, it looked uh, somewhat formidable with its four-bladed props and its guns in the tail and the guns around the body of the fuselage and a little gun in the navigator's compartment. So it was a forbidding looking airplane. Cow flaps open. Open. Magruder was an innovator and incorporated many new advanced design features which included tricycle landing gear, an old plexiglass nose, and the latest electrical bomb site. Stand by for takeoff. All right, here we go. But the additional weight of the Army's modifications had also turned Magruder's streamlined aircraft into a potential killer. The twin-engined bomber now required extremely skilled handling from the new pilots especially for takeoffs and landings. One of the first ones I flew was an 11th airplane off the line. And they were having quite a lot of problems with it. And if I recall, the second day I was there, one of them went in off the end of the runway and exploded. And let's say that got my attention. I had a feeling that I was uh, trying to learn to fly something that was quite a bit more of an airplane than the trainers I had flown in flying school. And so it was a thrill and also a hint of caution that I'd better handle it very carefully and still be aggressive enough to learn to fly it as well as my instructor. Due to the lack of testing, the new aircraft suffered from a series of problems. Nose wheel struts collapsed, hydraulic lines leaked, fuel lines clogged, and the yet untested four-bladed propellers regularly failed. To make matters worse, by the autumn of 1941, difficulties arose in material shortages in the defense industry. Aluminium and propellers were just not available. The airplanes were coming off the assembly line, but there were no props. So we would fly an airplane from Baltimore to Barksdale and take the props off and, and get them back up to Baltimore and do this again and bring airplanes down. By the end of 1941, the Martin factory finally completed the first delivery of 261 aircraft to the U.S. Air Corps. The delivery was just in time to be deployed in the front line of American forces in the desperate days after Pearl Harbor. New pilots were now urgently needed for combat, but within months, this aircraft was proving too hot to handle, with an alarmingly high number of deadly accidents. The B-26 Marauder quickly gained the notorious reputation as the Widowmaker. I was just petrified when I realized here I was on an airbase full of those creatures, and I was going to have to be a pilot in one of them. In February 1942, 
the Martin B-26 Marauder had its baptism of fire in the Pacific War. This was the most advanced medium-range bomber in the world, but early combat operations were marred by one disaster after another. For the new, hastily trained pilots, it soon earned a reputation as a death trap. Coming right out of flying school and going over to Barksdale Field from Arizona, I really didn't know very much about it except that it was new. But once I got there, I began to hear these stories, and then I kind of wondered what I was getting into. They called it the Widowmaker, which it made lots of widows. They called it the Baltimore Whore, which is a bad word, but that, they said, it had no visible means of support. And uh, the Flying Torpedo, uh, they had a lot of bad names for it. Trainee pilots were finding the B-26 too hot to handle. With fast landing speeds of 125 miles per hour, Trainees would bring it in too slow. It would then stall, spin, and crash. It had more of a fighter plane feel to that airplane. When you came in for a landing, you didn't just bring it in in a nice controlled sliding approach. You brought it in a very steep angle. And then at the very last minute, you would flare it out. And if your timing was right, you would kind of grease it on. If not, you'd splatter it pretty hard, or if you did it too high, you would hit pretty hard. Pilots in training were having serious problems learning to fly the new bomber. I actually had ten of them walk in one morning and place their wings on my desk, and they got the choice of being mess officers or going down to Trinidad and flying B-18s on sub patrol. We had five or six pilots that finally gave up flying. They just re refused to fly any more combat. And I had unfortunately made a statement to a, another pilot that I was flying co-pilot for. He was a very ham-handed pilot, and he just frightened it. He really flight frightened the daylights out of me the way he flew. So when I got back on the ground after this one mission, I told him, I'm never going to fly combat again if I have to fly with you. Ground crews were also experiencing severe problems in maintaining and servicing the new aircraft. We had a lot of tire problems, and if an airplane blew a tire right at lift off, it usually killed the crew. And sometimes if you came in and the tire was shot up, one tire was shot up and he landed, well, a lot of times it did kill the crew also. The results were a series of deadly accidents. By early 1942, in a period of just 30 days, 15 B-26s were written off in crashes. One a day in Tampa Bay, that was the motto. I lost a bunch of friends. They had seven of us graduate from cadet school at Luke Field. We, they had, had us find fighters out there. And in six weeks, out of the seven, me and Pete Graves, only two left alive. The other five were out there swimming around. By now, the Committee on Military Affairs, headed by Senator Harry Truman, had begun to investigate the reasons behind so many fatalities. Were Martin's B-26 marauders a death trap for American airmen? After 165 accidents and dozens of trainee crew killed, the Truman Committee recommended that all production and flying should be halted. But the Air Force still had faith in the plane and gave the responsibility of salvaging its reputation to General James Doolittle, commander of the celebrated Tokyo Raid of April 1942. It would be a do-or-die operation. Jimmy Doolittle probably the best pilot that we ever had. He had flown uh, air races and uh, he was a B-26 advocate. He thought it was a good airplane. He was always someplace flying. He was not a guy that was a desk jockey. And as a result, he was a pilot's pilot. And he came down and actually landed it on one engine and he flew around and, and rung it out over the top of the airport while all the young pilots were standing there watching him. And they said, Jesus, if he can do that, 
we can too. You knew that there was a man that had flown a lot of airplanes and knew what he was doing. And he pushed the limits a little bit because uh, he made tighter turns than the rest of us. <laughs> and scared a little of, uh, but we knew that we had a guy that knew what his limits were. The report revealed that the causes of the accidents were due mainly to the inexperience of the pilots and maintenance mechanics, along with the increased heavy weight of the airframe. To stop further problems with the dangerously overloaded planes, the engineers introduced a more powerful engine and also extended the wings by three feet. This made the plane much easier to control, especially takeoffs and landings. Doolittle organized a new training program for both pilots and mechanics. Flying demonstrations were performed by the legendary test pilot Vincent Squeak Burnett to boost morale and renew faith in the marauder. Take a look, Jim. Since you're going to be a B-26 pilot, that's your Bible. Uh, left landing gear and wheel well check. Well, that uh, U-lock the crew member's removing is a safety precaution we have to prevent anyone from raising the landing gear while the ship's on the ground. You don't mean to tell me that's ever happened. That and worse. Now get on with that checklist and see that none of those other things ever happen to you. You fly for a while, Jim. Get the feel of the controls. See how easily she handles. Doolittle's training program had rescued the B-26 from congressional action. But the stigma of the Widowmaker would not go away. The Marauder would have to prove its critics wrong where it mattered, in combat. And now the moment had come, as the B-26 Marauder headed for war in the deserts of North Africa. In November 1942, the 319th B-26 Bomb Group joined American forces in support of Operation Torch, the amphibious landings in North Africa. But using the new medium bomber for low-level ground attack operations could be disastrous. Early missions were riddled with organizational chaos. What happened in Africa that we had no strategy whatsoever? There was no bombing strategy, there was no coordination, there was no photographs, maps of the target, they were hand-drawn maps. In fact, our first flight that went out with five planes, none of them come back. The crews of the B-26 Marauders were capable of delivering a devastating attack, dropping up to 4,000 pounds of high-explosive bombs. The Air Force tried and tested new tactics with massed squadron formation flying at medium altitude and bombing a single target for maximum effectiveness. The accuracy of hitting the target was dependent on the combined skills of the pilot and the lead bombardier with his sophisticated Norden bombsight. The general routine was you had an initial point, they called it, a specific geographic point on the ground, you would turn then and go to what they call the AP, the aiming point. And as you went toward the aiming point, the uh, bombardier would get his Norden bombsight, which was an early model of a computer. He would get it organized so that he'd say left, left, right, right, up, up, down, down, whatever, to get the pilot and that, that um, computer going together. The Norden bombsight was one of the U.S. Air Force's most secret weapons. This early computer calculated exactly when and where to drop the bombs, allowing for altitude, airspeed, and crosswinds. And so when you get to your point and you call the pilot and say, OK, I have it, and you go straight and level, and you look in front of you and it looks like thunderclouds, it's black, it's uh, dirty, uh, you feel like, and you almost could, that you could see the Germans at their gun positions. 
then we would go on through. All we could do is just sit there like this because the airplane was being flown by that computer. It's a moment of truth where everybody has to stop wiggling around trying to evade the flak and wade through. You lean over and when you do, you go for the eyepiece and you're watching the crosshairs that are moving. You stop them and that means you've corrected to the ground speed. And when they get together, the bombs are gone. The minute he'd say bombs away, then boy, we had our hands on the control. Sometimes both of us would be, you know, getting it into whatever direction we'd pre-planned for the breakaway. Time stands still. <laughs> Trust me, it's it's a long, long run. When it really is probably is three to four minutes, five minutes, but it seems a lot longer than that. The home run to the target for the crews of the Marauders was no easy ride. We had done our job, dropped, dropped the bombs. We encountered some flak and some fighters, but my airplane didn't get hit. And uh, we were all assembled and going back to our base. But on one mission, one of the Marauders was hit by flak and unable to rejoin the formation. We were supposed to all stay together, and if Guy got crippled, it was his tough luck. But I didn't dare. I didn't want to do that. This guy was out there by himself. He could have been picked off. But I got close enough to be tightened up for defensive purposes to take a look at him. Well, he was flying straight and level, trying to keep it going, but he had to fly slower because he was crippled. So I had a camera there that we all had that if something unusual occurred, you could use a camera if you weren't busy fighting off something. And while the other guy flew the airplane, I took this picture myself. I noticed what was wrong. Both engines were moving, but under, underneath, there was a big gash in the left wing. There were holes all along the side of it facing me. This airplane flew all the way back. It was some, it must have been about 150 miles or so that he flew back with me on his wing. He couldn't make a normal landing. He made a belly landing, got those gear wheels up and skidded in. Nobody was injured inside, but the airplane was really wrecked. The Marauder was not only capable of surviving severe punishment, but was also recognized as a valuable kit of spare parts. If it hadn't been for airplanes bellying in, we would not have made it. That was our spare parts, airplanes bellying in, and as soon as we, we had a crew of people that went over and took parts off the airplane and said, had them put back in a storage so we could have them when we needed them. In terms of belly landings as being a source of a possible crash, nobody really worried about that. We could skid that doggone thing right in, whether it was on mud or on a paved runway or not. And if we had to do it, we'd do it. And in fact, most people would rather make a belly landing than get it up there and bail out and let the airplane fall. In the first three weeks of operation in North Africa alone, the B-26s of 319th Bomb Group had flown just 20 missions, losing 10 aircraft and 40 men. Now it was the B-26's combat losses that were called into question. Within weeks, the American forces in North Africa had joined the British 8th Army in defeating the feared German Africa Corps. The Air Force continued to experiment with the B-26, bombing at different altitudes, but soon realized that it was most effective between 10 and 12,000 feet, exactly the height it was originally designed for. The first three or four missions, we, we went from the deck up to about 3,000 to 4,000, 5,000. It still wasn't enough. But very soon we learned uh, that you had to get up above 7,500 feet to be safe from the kind of anti-aircraft, light anti-aircraft flak that they threw up at you. You knew you were going to be attacked coming out of the target area, so you had to get back into tight formation quickly so that your gunners would have the mass effect for the German planes who were coming trying to attack us. They'd like to have us scattered out and pick us off one at a time. And uh, so we didn't, uh, we didn't want to have that happen. 
The B-26 Marauder had proved to be a tough and durable aircraft. We had them come back with half the tail shot away and, and uh, engine shot out. And, uh, 26 would absorb a lot, of, a lot of damage. It just seemed to me like that that engine was well built. It would take a lot of beating. We had occasions where engines were shot out. Uh, oh, we've been beat up any number of times uh, where you get damage to the plane. Uh, there are even occasions where the crew, parts of the crews were killed. The plane came back. The Marauder was fast earning a reputation as a deadly precision bomber. And at the Casablanca conference in January 1943, Winston Churchill persuaded Roosevelt to continue with the Mediterranean campaign to force Italy out of the war and draw German forces from the Russian front, preparing the ground for the invasion of France. In the Allied invasion of Italy, Martin's marauders would add another deadly chapter to their history by taking part in one of the most famous and controversial conflicts of the Second World War, the Battle for Monte Cassino. By 1943, a change of tactics from low-level to medium-altitude bombing and the combat experience of the Marauder crews had finally brought a change of fortune. The Marauders were having increasing success on their bombing missions, but flying into enemy flak was always a terrifying experience. We could look ahead and I remember saying to the uh, pilot, I nudged him, I said, what in the hell is that? He looked at it and he said, you've seen flak before. I said, that's flak? Well, here was this solid black band with red flashes all through it. Well, the Germans had already picked up our altitude, direction, and everything else. So they were just laying a barrage into our flight path. And I don't know how we got through that. I mean, you can almost walk on this stuff. It's big black puffs. And when you have one where your airplane shudders, that means you done got took on some of this stuff. When you could see flak, then it was reasonably close. When you could uh, hear it, it was very close. When you could smell it or feel it, it was terribly close, within 40 feet of you. Well, that's what we felt all the way through that black cloud was the aircraft just bouncing and the smell of cordite or whatever that powder is. Uh, we could feel the stuff, we could hear it, we could smell it. I was there as we were on the bomb run before we got to the target and we were getting an awful lot of flak. But pieces began to fly off of our lead ship. They were bouncing off of us. And uh, it was a scary experience. I had to try to keep straight and level while we're going trying to get on our target. But uh, in doing that, and uh, worrying about the bursts of flak that were coming all around, uh, all of a sudden, I found a, I, there was a bump on my head, bang, like somebody hit me with a hammer and knocked my uh, goggles flying and whatever else I had on my head uh, to protect my, my skull. But uh, just, it was a sudden shock. And what had happened was that a piece of flak came right through plexiglass, right straight ahead of me. And of course, if I'd have been done like our, my grade school teachers used to say, sit up straight, uh, Conlon, I'd have been dead and I would have gone right through here. Fortunately, I was a little slumped and it went right through here grazed the top of my scalp, but it hit hard, drew a lot of blood. It was a shock, it was a, it was a surprise, and I knew, was, uh, I didn't know how bad it was, and then, but I was not unconscious, so I, I could still function, but I had to get this blood stopped, and so the, the next thing happened was someone was bandaging me and the other guy was flying the airplane till we could get to back out of this flak, and, and fighter, fighters were now coming in too. I had a whopping headache for the next day, but other than that, I, I was okay. The Allied invasion of Italy was launched in September 1943. 
In an attempt to hold the threatened city of Rome, the Germans constructed a series of defensive lines. The last and most formidable, the Gustav Line, was anchored on the heavily fortified garrison town of Cassino. Strategically, Monte Cassino is absolutely pivotal. It's a formidably strong mountainous area right in the middle of the Gustav Line, which protects the direct route for the Allies to take Rome. Now, what had happened in early 1944 is that not only had a direct assault on the Gustav Line failed, but the Allies had tried to get round it by going to Anzio, and that also had stalled. So one way or the other, they were going to have to solve the problem of Monte Cassino. Throughout the weeks of heavy fighting, the sacred monastery of Monte Cassino had been left untouched. This 5th century monastery, founded by St. Benedict, was internationally renowned as a place of holiness, culture and art. But the Allies suspected that it was the base for the German defenders. In a highly controversial move, it was ordered to be destroyed. And of course all the Catholic people and all, all totally freaked out because you ain't supposed to do that. You know, it's a, it's a shrine. Well, it ain't no shrine if the Germans are in there with machine guns killing our boys. Gentlemen, we all know the purpose of this operation against Casino. The timing works like this, sir. The attack will be opened by medium bombers, beginning with the B-25s, the tactical air force. Then come the heavies in waves of 15-minute intervals. Following the heavies, the B-26s will complete the attack. And uh, during the briefing there, as I say, we had a... Catholic chaplain get up and asked if any Catholic present, and there were some, you know, in every group. And the next question was, do you want to go? And if you don't want to, you don't have to. Yeah, but the Pope said, give them hell. So we did. The sky was full of every kind of aircraft that I knew of in the whole uh, Southern European theater. The B-17s, B-24s, the uh, P-47 dive bombers, the Spitfires that we had covering us, the P-51s that had just come in, everything was in the air. The Germans were firmly dug in, and as the formations of marauders approached Monte Cassino, the skies were ablaze with flak from the German guns. We're getting shot up pretty good, but you see, the pilot, he don't see a lot. In other words, he goes up there on the lead ship. Now, he flies the airplane up to this bomb run, and at that point, this northern bomb site takes over. Well, I remember seeing the casino. It was a white building sitting up there, and to me, it looked like a white picket fence, you know, around it. And we made our bomb run, and as we was making our bomb run, uh, we came in and the, uh, dropped our bombs, and I could see them exploding from one end to the other of the casino, and nothing but dust underneath there. On February the 15th, 1944, to the shock of the world, the monastery was leveled. The accuracy of the B-26's bombing proved without a shadow of a doubt that if used properly, Martin's aircraft was a potent weapon. It was solid stone, you know. Them friars built a heck of a, <laughs> heck of a fry. They, the, the walls on that thing were six, eight foot thick. We knocked it down to rubble. We went twice a day. So we finally knocked it down and killed every German big enough to die. The Germans, after we bombed, they come out of the rubble and were still holding it, so the British and the Americans both uh, had a hard time taking it, even after we blew it up. The bombing of Monte Cassino was a tragedy. Ironically, the bombing itself worked reasonably well. The B-26s did a good job, the bombing was quite accurate, and the monastery itself was leveled. The Germans then occupied the ruins, and the Allies simply weren't able to get them out of the ruins. Thus, although the bombing worked in the short term, the Allied operation to smash a hole through the Gustav line 
failed. It was, however, a turning point for the Marauder. The introduction of the new Norden bombsight, the quality of bombs it could deliver, and the speed and handling of the aircraft had all combined to make it a formidable machine. The Marauder could now literally deliver bombs on a button. Following the Mediterranean campaign and the fall of Rome, the B-26 Marauder and its crew's reputation was growing from one victory to the next. Despite its notorious birth as the flying coffin, the Marauder was proving to be an outstanding aeroplane and feared adversary. The improved bombing accuracy and switch to medium altitude tactics meant that the Marauders had now come into their own. D-Day would provide the Marauders with new challenges. The B-26s were called upon to soften up the enemy in an intense pre-landing bombardment. They played a key role attacking German troop movements, communications and defences. Marauders of the 9th Air Force fly over the invasion surface fleet, past the beachhead to strike at enemy concentrations. And when the Allies invaded southern France, the B-26s helped to neutralise the heavily fortified southern French ports of Bordeaux and Toulon. Designated as a fortress by Hitler, the port of Toulon was dominated by hundreds of shore batteries and anti-aircraft guns. If the harbour was to be captured, the guns had to be destroyed. From 10 to 11,000 feet, we could put 90% of the bombs in a 600-foot circle. We could hit the target, we could defend ourselves, and hit it and get back. In 48 separate missions, losing just eight aircraft, the Marauders dropped one of the most concentrated barrages of the war. Never before had the Marauders' ability as a precision bomber proved so effective. On August the 23rd, 1944, Toulon fell. The Allies' successful campaign continued across occupied France and by August 1944, Paris was liberated. Now, with Germany buckling under, the marauders were deployed in bombing enemy defensive positions on the eastern side of the Rhine. The medium bombers were ideally suited to destroy the enemy's road and rail networks. In the final months of the war in Europe, the formidable B-26 crews were flying a record number of missions, often under heavy attack. The much maligned medium bomber now had a reputation for flying into battle and achieving pinpoint accuracy. The Marauder was also admired by its crews for its strength and ability to take intense punishment. Towards the end of the war, on a bombing mission across the Rhine, B-26 bombardier Charles Mews had an experience he will never forget. We were just uh, 20 miles or so from Strasbourg, and we took a hit. Then the next hit, uh, we got, I think, was in the Bombay. And at that point, we realized that we were hit. We were not going to make it. It was chaotic. You know, neither, neither engine was doing what it was supposed to do. We had fire. I could see the fire. You know, there was no mystery about it. The co-pilot was uh, sitting, <laughs> trying to get out, uh, which he couldn't. Uh, but uh, his parachute strap had caught on the seat. Uh, the release to the co-pilot seat was between the pedals. I could reach it. I did reach it. I pulled her sideways and he went backwards. After successfully releasing the co-pilot, Muse was able to make his escape from the bombardier's position. So we got the co-pilot, he was the first one out. We got him through. The top turret gunner was dead. The tail gunner and radio gunner made their dramatic escape, bailing out past the landing gear, leaving just Muse and the pilot in the plane. We were trying to debate whether or not we would stay with the plane because we could see the Rhine River and we could see safety and home. 
we finally got to the point saying, no, 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 we're gonna, gonna take the way out and out we went. I remember the tremendous quietness. You're hanging on a parachute, swinging gently in the breeze, you hope, and everybody's gone, everybody's left you. I was not heroic. I knew when I was caught and I stopped and promptly showed my hands and stood still and so then, then it was taken prisoner. Muse was captured along with the rest of his crew. They spent the last few months of World War II as prisoners of war. In May 1945, victory over Nazi Germany was complete. By the end of the war, the record of the marauders was outstanding. Its bombing accuracy had made an important contribution to winning the war in Europe. The B-26 had made aviation history. With an enviable record for survival, its actual combat losses were fewer than any other Allied bomber in the war. Dogged by its reputation as a widow-maker from cradle to grave, this remarkable plane was tragically buried without the military honors it so richly deserved. With the war over in the late autumn of 1945, the 500 remaining B-26s were blown up for scrap in Germany. Ironically, the aluminium was collected to help rebuild the devastated German metal industry. I would say that considering its birth, when it came out and how many people it killed, it was a bad airplane. Now, as we learned to fly it, and as the mechanics learned to maintain it, it became a good airplane. It had holes all over the airplane and still it was flying. Come home on one engine, fly almost the whole distance on it. And that was a pleasant surprise. And so that, we kind of loved that airplane after seeing what it did for us in so many missions. That was probably one of the greatest aircraft we ever had in the military in those days in terms of its ability to take a terrible, terrible beating. And that was one thing that made it uh, tenable for us to fly that airplane and keep on flying it, because we knew that sucker would bring us back. You know, it might be hard getting back, but it would get us back. 